I've heard it said that you're born into this world alone, and when you die, you go out the same way. That was certainly true for me. You see, I was born in 1859 in the mountains of eastern Kentucky. My childhood, if you want to call it that, was virtually non-existent. They say my pa was a preacher, and back in those days, the clergy wasn't paid except for the occasional basket of apples or bottle of brandy, which meant that I was born into a life of extreme poverty. And by the time I was just five years old, my father was murdered in the driveway when he got into an argument with another man as I played in the yard. A few months later, Ma took sick and died of typhoid in the winter of 1864. Not that I remember either of them. The fact is, I don't. You know how sometimes you experience something so traumatic that your brain goes into a sort of safe mode and it locks away those memories somewhere deep down in your subconsciousness. And no matter how you try, you can never find them again. And the only time they seem to resurface is in your dreams. The types of dreams where you feel like you're wide awake, but you can't move. You're literally paralyzed. It's only when you finally wake up in a cold sweat that you realize it wasn't real. Or was it? Anyway, after Ma and Pa were gone, my sisters went and lived with some kinfolk a couple counties over. While me and my older brother Bill, we bounced around from house to house, depending on who needed an extra set of hands on the farm. Just like that, we never saw our sisters again. And other than my brother, I never had any sense of family from a very young age. Before long, Bill and I began running with the wrong crowd and committing petty crimes here and there but mainly out of necessity. One day, we came upon a few boys who were swimming at Troublesome Creek. They had left all their clothes and their shoes up on the bank. And we stole everything. This was the first pair of long pants and shoes that I ever had. And back then, if you wore long pants, you were no longer a boy. So I guess you could say, I became a man at the age of 12. When the folks we were staying with saw the new clothes we had, they kicked us out because they weren't going to let no thieves live under their roof. Bill was three years older than me, and he began selling us out as day laborers for whatever part-time work we could find. We were inseparable, and living on our own made us street smart, and we did whatever we had to to take care of each other. This was a time of great change in Perry County, Kentucky. The war between the states had just ended, but most folks held strong to both their Union and Confederate allegiances. Most every man walking the streets was a veteran of the war, armed to the teeth with all of the surplus weapons left over from the conflict. There was also an abundance of cheap moonshine, the combination of mountain men trained in military assault tactics, an abundance of arms and liquor made for a volatile combination. Bill and I witnessed countless shootouts. We admired the way these men carried themselves. They were quick-tempered, and they took law into their own hands. Nobody crossed them, and if you were looking for a fight, they would bring more than you could handle. Many of them worked as enforcers for local merchants and wealthy businessmen, sort of an army for hire, for men looking to protect their assets from any potential competition. They paid their hired gunmen as much as $2 a day, which was a fortune back then. These outlaws were dressed in flashy suits with Colt revolvers hanging from their sides. And even though I was just a teen, I wanted to be just like them. They belonged to an outlaw brotherhood. And one day I swore I'd be part of it too. Now 
Back in those days, politics was a very public enterprise and would cause all sorts of violence. You see, elections were a big event, and they would take place in front of everyone where all the men from the surrounding mountains would make a pilgrimage to the county seat to participate. The events leading up to an election took on a carnival-type atmosphere. Each politician would hold strongman events, boxing, arm wrestling, and fist fights. many times fighting in the competitions themselves. Each would-be politician would give speeches during these events, trying to sway men to vote for him. Meanwhile, rival politicians were known to bring in outlaw gangs to raise enough hell in a ruckus. On the day of the election, to try and keep folks from showing up and voting for their opponent. It was an exciting time, and you never knew what you'd see. But one thing's for sure. Once the election took place, no man could hide his true allegiances. They would have each politician stand in a public place, and each voter would stand with their politician. Slowly, all the mountain men would begin to fall in next to their candidate. And once every man had taken a side, an official would simply count how many men stood with each contestant and declare a winner. It was common for tempers to flare, and many lifelong feuds were born out of these events, as no man could hide his political allegiance. One man would look out across the aisle and see his neighbor standing against him. And just like that, a bloody feud would ignite that would burn for generations. These stand-up elections caused so much violence back then. It led to our current system where folks hide behind a curtain and choose their politician in secret. It was during one of these stand-up elections where I began to take a turn towards the outlaw life. By now, I was 16 years old, and my older brother and I had made a few enemies after a string of petty crimes. Over the past few years living on our own, a big election was happening, and Hazard, Kentucky was buzzing with excitement. Anyone who was anybody was in town. The night before the election, we were sitting outside the local saloon when two strangers approached us. Are you them Smith boys? A rugged man asked. Who wants to know? My brother replied. Well, the way I hear it, you boys look just like the ones who stole a brand new saddle off old man Pickett's horse last week. Now, my brother was only 19, but he was just as big as any mountain man, and he had a quick temper. He stood up and said, We might have borrowed it from him, but I reckon it ain't none of your business, stranger. Is that a fact? The stranger laughed. Well, I'm making it my business. And with that, he pulled out a Colt revolver and pointed it at my older brother, Bob. Both men stood there laughing, and one of them spit a plug of tobacco at me. What you got to say now, boy? The mountaineer barked. And while they were both backing up my brother, I reached down and I picked up a rock as big as my fist, and I swung with all my might, and I hit the other man right in the head. He was unconscious before he hit the ground. In a flash, I picked up his musket, and I shot the man who was holding the pistol on my brother. I dropped the musket, and I picked up the pistol, and we both took off as several men gave chase. Without even thinking, both of us jumped on the first two horses we saw, and we took off. Now, I need a pause here for just a moment. There comes a moment when a man knows his life will never be the same, that there's no turning back. And for me, this was it. As my brother and I were making our escape, I could hear the bullets zipping by my head as the gunshots rang out from men firing at us. But I wasn't scared. No, sir. In fact, I had never felt so alive as I did in this moment. My eyes were wide open, and I began to laugh uncontrollably as I emptied every bullet out of that colt, picking off another three men before we disappeared into the night. Our getaway was short-lived. A posse had formed within an hour, and by sunrise, my brother and I were arrested and taken back to jail in Hazard. Despite our age, we knew we were sure to hang for stealing those horses if we were convicted. Wagon tongues had spread our story all over Perry County, and within a few days, to our surprise, we were released, and the charges were suddenly dropped. You see, back then, there really wasn't a law to speak of in eastern Kentucky. So much so that every business had hired men to protect their land and their assets, basically employing a personal militia. And one of the wealthiest men in Perry County 
was Benjamin French. He was a powerful man who owned a general store, and he also represented a powerful coal company where he was an agent buying up all the mineral rights in the area. He had made a habit of ripping farmers off by paying them pennies on the dollar for their land. To say he was a hated man is a massive understatement. Most folks wanted him dead. So much so that French had hired a personal army to protect his interest. Many of his men were Civil War veterans who were ruthless to any man who dared cross them. It seems that French was impressed with my brother and I and how we handled ourselves. Even though we were just teens, he hired us as part of his regulators for $14 a week. Suddenly, we had money to dress in the finest suits and we patrolled the streets of Hazard. And just like that, we were the law in a lawless land. By now, I was getting a bit of a reputation as a ladies man. I had become known as a good looking man with flawless skin and a sly smile that they couldn't seem to resist. Me, the one thing I couldn't resist was the endless supply of cheap whiskey that seemed to flow 100 proof right out of the side of the mountains. And once I got a belly full of it, my good looks morphed in one of the most evil looking men you ever saw. I spent most of my days roughing up any potential threats to my employer and most nights gambling, drinking, and practicing the fine art of courting a different lady most every night. Occasionally, Mr. French would pull me aside and offer me a bonus of five dollars to settle a score on his behalf. I always knew what that meant, even if he didn't outright say it. He wanted a man dead. And during these days, the most common tactic for assassinating a man was always from the ambush, a musket shot that rang out from a cornfield as a man traveled on a horse down a mountain road, or the crack of a rifle from high atop a bluff overlooking a river crossing. There was little risk of a counterattack and no threat of being identified. I had taken out five men on orders from Mr. French in this fashion. I felt no emotion as I pulled the trigger, no remorse. I had become numb to it all. Suddenly, Something inside me began to change. It wasn't enough just to kill a man. I began to crave, seeing the look in his eyes as he took his final breath. And this was something you couldn't do from the distance. It was far more personal and gratifying to watch a man's soul leave his mortal body. And the first time this happened, I had orders to kill the leader of the powerful Eversoul clan. He was a made man, untouchable and responsible for killing dozens of the hired guns of the French militia. I waited atop a hill overlooking the main road into Hazard for three days before I saw him riding in. He had two other riders with him, but it didn't matter to me. My brother and I both fired at the same time, killing Joseph Eversoul, graveyard dead before he hit the ground, and wounded one of the other men as the third man escaped. As we were relieving the dead man of his sidearm, and the contents of its coat pockets. I heard some rustling in the ditch on the side of the road. I walked over and looked, and there was a second man, gasping, clinging on to the last moments of life. I walked over and stood over his body. It was the county judge's 14-year-old son. He began to beg me, Please, don't shoot me again. You've already killed me. Yet I felt no remorse. Dead man, tell no tales, my friend. I replied as I raised my revolver and I shot him right through his right eye, killing him instantly. Let's go, Tom, let's get out of here, my brother Bob yelled out. But I stood there over my victim, taking in the moment, and without any consideration, I slowly pointed my pistol to the left, and I shot out his other eye. I had become a cold-blooded killer. Even within the outlaw gang that I ran with, I was the most ruthless of them all. The way I began to kill men disturbed even the most savage men. Before long, even though I was the youngest in the militia, I had risen to the top of this band of mercenaries, and I was calling the shots. Even among criminals, there were unwritten rules for killing a man. If a marked man was at home with his family, it was said, you would have to wait until he was found elsewhere to launch your attack. Yet. In a never-ending quest to quench my thirst for blood, there were no boundaries I wouldn't cross 
I shot a man named Robin Cornett, a rival of my boss in the timber industry, and I shot him point blank just to see the look in his eye. Once I had orders to kill a man named Joe Hurt, who had crossed words with my employer. The plan was to launch a surprise attack on Monday morning as he rode his horse to his job at the sawmill. However, I decided not to wait and I set out on my own to his cabin. As soon as I rounded the bend in the road, I saw him standing in his front yard playing with his kids as his wife sat on the porch. I simply rode right up to him, pulled out my coat, and shot him dead as his wife and children screamed in horror. I tipped my hat to the missus and calmly left the scene. By now, I spent most every night turning up bottomless jugs of whiskey before retiring for the evening with a new female companion. No matter how much I drank, I could never sleep through the night and I began to have terrible dreams, powerful dreams that paralyzed me and the faces of the men that I'd killed haunted me, especially the 14-year-old boy. I saw his face every time I closed my eyes. In each of these dreams, I could see a hangman's noose looming in the distance, waiting patiently, calling for me. I'd wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of each night, the room still spinning from too much drink and some strange woman laying beside me. By 1889, I was 30 years old and I'd killed several men. It was only a matter of time for the law caught up with me, and soon it did. My brother and I were standing trial for murder in the Perry County Courthouse for crimes we had committed during the Eversole French War. During the trial, gunfire erupted in the streets, causing the courthouse to empty. In the confusion, my brother and I jumped out a second story window where we ran across the lawn to the police department. There, we took possession of an unlimited supply of guns and ammo, and what happened next was probably the most epic gun battle in the history of Appalachia. For 52 hours, my brother and I single-handedly held off 55 men with bullets raining down from the sky non-stop. On the third night, we escaped under the cover of darkness, where we poured kerosene around the courthouse and we burned it to the ground. And then we threw a stick of dynamite through the judge's window. Just like that, the charges were suddenly dropped against us. However, we knew it was time to leave Hazard, so we did. I said goodbye to my brother, who had been by my side my entire life. He headed out west to try to disappear. Me, it seemed like I was destined for a life of violence. So I headed to Bloody Breathed County, Kentucky. My reputation was well known, and I was hired right away as an enforcer for a powerful judge who owned the largest department store in eastern Kentucky, named Mammoth Department Store. I patrolled the streets of Jackson, which was a boom town that boasted the world's largest sawmill, and they had a railroad. My job was to keep folks in line during the day. I was still a hit with the ladies, and I soon partnered up with a married woman named Catherine McQuinn, whose husband had been committed to an insane asylum. And it would turn out that she was just as low down and evil as I was. I moved in with her, and together, we ran all the liquor and the gambling action during the night at a place called the Cat House. I got in several more alcohol-fueled brawls. For once, I was shot by a deputy, and his bullet shattered my arm and severed an artery. I almost bled to death, but it seemed I was just too mean to die. A local doctor in town, Dr. J.E. Rader, had nursed up my wound and most likely saved my life. But during my stay at his home, I couldn't help but notice the stylish lifestyle he was living, all the imported furniture and fancy china, and that big safe sitting in his office. Now, historians and scholars like to debate to this very day on what happened next, 
Some say I concocted a plan with Miss McQuinn to rob the doctor at night, while others claim it was something more scandalous and that the good doctor, Miss McQuinn and I, engaged in, shall we say, a menage aux trois as payment for his medical services. But one thing is certain. When the sun rose the next morning, Dr. Ratter was laying on the floor of his bedroom and he had been shot through the heart. But just who had pulled the trigger? Well, my friend, that would be up to the judge and the jury to decide. We were both incarcerated and we faced death if we were convicted. The trial captivated the nation's attention and made headlines everywhere. Miss McQuinn testified that I assassinated the doc while he was in his sleep, but I swore that I begged her not to shoot him, but she did anyway. It seemed the jury believed both of us equally, and within three minutes of deliberating, they returned with first-degree murder convictions for both of us. Miss Quinn was given a life sentence in prison. Me? Well, I was sentenced to death by hanging. So much for equality. Just like that, the outlaw days of bad Tom Smith came to an end. And even though he made a prison escape attempt, he wouldn't get away this time. He spent months in jail, exhausting all his appeals, even appealing to the Kentucky governor for a pardon, who simply replied, I regret to inform you that I'm unable to interfere with mountain justice. That's right. Even though Tom maintained his innocence, bloody Breathitt County was buzzing with excitement as they prepared for the first legal hanging in the history of Kentucky. Newspapers across the country ran articles urging folks to bring the whole family out to the hanging. By the time June 28, 1895 arrived, the stage was set. A huge wooden scaffold structure that took a whole week to build was finally finished and loomed over the town square just outside of the jailhouse. All of the hotels in the surrounding towns were sold out and all of the dirt roads leading into Jackson were packed with horses and wagons. Trains had run nonstop for days bringing in over 7,000 people and 100 gallons of whiskey by rail. Folks had camped out for days in front of the scaffolding in effort to have the best view of the hanging. There was a carnival-type atmosphere with women and children everywhere. Heck, even notorious outlaws from all over Appalachia had descended on the town to witness their old buddy's final act. Inside the jail was a much more somber atmosphere. Bad Tom Smith had sat in solitude for much of the morning in deep reflection. The night before, he had woke up screaming to the guards that the ghosts of the men he murdered were in the cell with him. Soon, the sheriff came to him. Tom, it's time. Do you have any final wish? Well, yes, yes I do. I'd like to be baptized before I hang. The stunned sheriff agreed, and a small army, along with 15 local preachers, led Bad Tom Smith to the banks of the Kentucky River and dunked him under the water. From there, he was led to the scaffolding where thousands of onlookers prepared for the main event. Gunmen were stationed atop every building in town just in case any of Bad Tom's allies tried to free him. By now, it was high noon and the temperature soared into the 90s. Tom walked slowly to the gallows, flanked by armed guards on all sides. The time had come to pay for his sins. A gasp and a sudden hush fell over the crowd as they got their first glimpse of the dead man walking, looking as clean as ever, dressed in a brand new suit. Bad Tom, the sheriff began. Do you have any final words? Tom nodded yes, and he began. Friends, one and all, I want to talk to you a little bit before I die. My last words on earth to you are to take warning from my fate. Bad whiskey and bad women have brought me to where I stand today. I've killed many men in cold blood, even Dr. Ryder. I admit it. Now, I hope you ladies won't take no umbrage to this, but I've told you the God's truth. To you little children, who were the first to be blessed by Jesus, I give this warning. Don't drink whiskey and don't chase women as I've done. A reverence fell over the crowd 
and many folks began bowing their heads, and not a single shuffle of one boot could be heard. Tom continued, I want everybody in this vast crowd that doesn't wish to do the things that I've done or to put themselves in the place that I now occupy. Just hold up your hands. Slowly, one by one, and then the thousands of sea of hands went into the air. Tom launched into a prayer. Oh God, this is beautiful. And I know this is what heaven will look like. By now, all the armed men on the scaffolding took a knee with their heads bowed. Suddenly, Tom began singing old hymns, such as Guide Me, O Great Jehovah. And nearer the cross, thousands of men, women and children, joined in singing. Tom continued, Again, I say to you, take warning from my fate and live better lives than I have. I die with no hard feelings towards anybody. Ain't a soul in this world that I hate. I love everybody. Farewell till we meet again. And with that, the sheriff slipped a black hood over bad Tom's face. Sobs and wails of sorrow echoed through the crowd. The executioner pulled the lever, and as the floor dropped underneath the condemned man's feet, bad Tom yelled, I am a sinner, God. Save me. And 17 minutes later, bad Tom Smith was pronounced dead. Dead.